Okay, so we're going to go ahead and get started with Unit 1. Um, unit 1 is primarily going to focus on the properties and the states of matter. This first section is going to give us the basic definitions and the basic words. Um, a lot of the vocabulary you may have already covered somewhere along the way. This is going to give us um, some context and kind of figure out how matter um, is related and how we examine it. Um, as always, if you have questions that come up as you're watching the videos, jot them down. Um, I will answer them next class period if we need anything clarified. Um, and as always, the general rule is if I write it down or I highlight it, that's a pretty good um, guide as to what you should be writing down and what you should be highlighting or underlining if you don't have a highlighter. All right, so let's go ahead and get started. All right, this first thing we're going to back up just a little bit and kind of talk about science. And science historically used to be divided into two pretty strict categories, and there were two of them. We had physical science, which mostly related to non-living things. We also had biological sciences, which related to living things. Now, your physical sciences typically um, included your chemistry, let's put this up here, all right, your chemistry as well as your physics, and then your biology was everything that was living. But the reality of it is, is that chemistry really falls under both categories, okay? It's not quite as simple as just saying chemistry is non-living, biology is living, because chemistry does allow us to study both living and non-living things, and we're going to do a lot of that um, throughout the course of this semester and throughout the course of the class. Now, our definition of chemistry, there are three parts to this definition, and typically if I ask you to write it down, you have to have all three parts to get it correct. The first part is the study of the composition, the structure, and the properties of matter. So what is matter? What is it made of? What does it look like? How is it built? Okay, so the basic premise of what is matter. Then the next part to that is what are the changes in the processes that can happen to matter. Okay, so we've got the basic structure, we've got what it looks like, then it turns into, okay, how can we change it? And then the third piece, which we don't do a ton of in this um, class, but it's really important, is the energy changes that accompany the changes that matter undergoes. And we're going to a lot of times refer, when we study energy and chemistry, we study heat flow. We study um, heat that is released, heat that is absorbed, and a lot of times we'll, um, when we get to a unit called thermochemistry, that's what we're going to be studying, which is energy. Now, as a reminder, evidence that you've watched this and that you've paid attention to it, one is going to be when I ask you questions in class, you can answer them, and two is that you write down things that I write down. Okay, so if you have need to pause here for a second, jot this stuff down, write it down so that I, when I check your notes, I can see that you've done those things. Okay, now chemistry is a lot of stuff. We use a lot of instruments, we use a lot of sciency looking things. And we use these instruments to improve our ability to observe and make measurements, okay? Because with chemistry, we're dealing with a lot of things that we can't necessarily see with the naked eye. So we need some technology with which to help us be able to do things. Um, this is a plain old thermometer right here that we've probably seen. Um, here is some different glassware that we'll learn about. You've got an Erlenmeyer flask right here. That's this lovely thing. You've got some beakers. Um, you've got a Florence flask. You've got an evaporation dish disk. So we've got lots of stuff. And then over here is a fancy analytical balance, um, a digital balance that everyone likes to read because it's easier. But we do these things in order to allow us to make measurements to study matter, which comes back to those three pieces of chemistry, which are to study matter, study the changes it undergoes, and study the energy. Now, chemicals work, chemists work with a lot of chemicals. Now, if I ask most of you to define the term chemicals, you're going to probably say things that are dangerous. Um, you may mentioned some poisonous things, things around the house, things to clean, stuff like that. But the reality of it is from our definition, a chemical is simply going to be any substance with a definite composition. Okay, and I guess we should say definite chemical composition, but that goes without, kind of think kind of goes without saying, um, which is essentially a ratio of atoms to each other and moles to each other. Now, all matter has a chemical basis, whether it is living or non-living. So again, here's that idea that we cannot pigeonhole chemistry into only a living or a non-living science, okay, that you're going to have a little bit of everything. And again, here are some pictures of things that, you know, we always think of dangerous, poisonous chemicals. Um, reality, Coca-Cola has a lot of different chemicals that just have 
definite composition in them. Um, rocks and minerals have a definite composition, and these are some different solids. Um, probably it's got some iron, we've got some copper, and maybe some co cobalt salt over here, um, different things. So anything with definite composition that you know is a chemical formula is so it's a little bit of a broader definition than what we use in society. And you're going to hear that me say that a lot, that in chemistry we use terms one way, whereas in society's general ideas we may use them a different way, and it's important to understand the context and the difference between those. Now here are some good old-fashioned vocab terms that hopefully we all remember. Um, probably from back in middle school. The first is matter. Matter is anything that has mass and volume. Volume is just another way of saying that something that takes up space takes up space. I don't care which one you write down. If you've got it in your head that matter is something that has mass and takes up space, well that that's fine by me. Um, an atom is the smallest unit of an element that actually keeps the properties of that element. And for example, hydrogen atom, anything on the periodic table is an element, so you could have oxygen atom, copper atom, anything there. Now an element is a pure substance made of only one type of atom. So again, we've got this whole periodic table thing where um, your examples might be oxygen, gold, carbon, silver, anything that's on that periodic table. So lots of vocab in unit one. Um, it's the only one, about the only one we do without any math. So it's a pretty good shot to get get a pretty decent grade under your belt and get the flow of the class. So, Okay, a couple more terms. We've got compound. A compound is a substance made of two or more types of atoms that are chemically bonded. Alright, so for example, water is H2O. You have a central oxygen and has two hydrogen atoms bonded to each other. We're going to talk about different types of bonds, but anything with more two or more types of atoms bonded together is going to be a compound. And we split that up a little bit. Um, a molecule is a specific type of compound, and a molecule is a type of compound that has covalent bonds. That's something that we will talk a lot about this year as well, okay, is covalent bonding and what that looks like. Um, mass is simply a measure of the amount of matter in something. Um, big thing that we're going to talk about a little bit later is mass versus weight. They are two different terms even though we like to use them interchangeably. Uh, in this class they do have very different definitions and I'm going to hold us accountable for that so you need to make sure that you keep that straight. Okay, some properties of matter. Well, chemists use characteristic properties to tell substances apart, to classify them, and to help separate them. Okay, and they we're going to hear a lot about all these different properties. So. Uh, types of properties. Um, first depends on how much is present and if that makes a difference. So an extensive property does depend on the amount of matter present. You may want to put the does in there. Okay, It does depend on the amount of matter. For example, the volume of something, the mass of something, the amount of energy it contains is directly related to how much is there. If there's more of stuff there, then the mass is going to be higher. If there's less stuff there, then the mass is going to be lower. So it is dependent on the amount of matter present. Whereas an intensive property does not depend on the amount of matter present. Okay, well what's an example of that? Well, the example of that might be density. Okay, might be boiling point. Uh, melting point is another good example. For example, water, water is going to boil Oops, that's a bad two. There we go. At 100 degrees Celsius, whether or not you have one liter or you have 57 liters. Okay, so it again, it does not depend on the amount present. Um, same thing with density. Things have the same density depending on if there is a lot present or a little present, as opposed to extensive, that um, it is dependent on how much is there. Okay, another type of classification of properties is going to be physical versus chemical. We're going to do a lab pretty early on on here that, that defines this, but a physical property is a characteristic that can be observed or measured without changing the identity of a substance. Okay, what am I talking about? Well, let's look at some pr examples down here. Physical properties include things like temperature, color, melting point, will it conduct electricity, how much is present, what does it smell like, will it dissolve in water, it's a fancy word for solubility, um, or that is the definition of solubility rather, is it hard, is it soft, you know, what is? what are those properties. Um, you can look at all these things again without changing the identity. I don't have to combust something to figure out what color it is, okay? As opposed to chemical properties 
that do relate to a substance's ability to undergo changes that transform it into a different substance. So that means that I do have to change it into something different in order to observe it. For example, will something rust? Will iron rust? Well, I have to see it rust, which is going to turn it into iron oxide, um, in order for it to happen. Combustion is a fancy word for burning, so will it actually burn? Um, I got to observe it. I got to turn it into something different. W will silver tarnish? Okay, which is kind of just another form of rusting. Um, and will cement harden? Okay, so those are all examples of chemical properties where I do have to physically or have to turn something into a new substance in order to observe it. And again, it's easy. This is easiest to see when the chemical is reacting because it's either happening or it's not, and that allows us to decide what the changes are. Okay, physical changes. Physical changes are a change in a substance that does not change the identity. We already talked about a physical property, which is really essentially the same definition. For example, grinding, grinding cutting, melting, boiling. Um, I'm changing the shape, I might be changing the state, but I'm not changing the identity. Okay, which leads us to another term, which is changes of state. Changes of state are physical changes of a substance from one, th one state to another. If I have water, it doesn't matter if I have ice, if I have liquid water, okay, or if I have steam, which is another word for gaseous water. It's still water. If I could look at those particles, I would still see that it was all H2O, 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 H2O. Okay, however, it's just the ice, they're closer together and they're more orderly. The liquid, they're still pretty close, but they're a little bit... Um, more disordered. Gas, they're really, 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 really far apart, but it's still water. Okay, solid. Again, definitions we should be familiar with from way back probably in middle school or elementary school. Definite volume, definite shape. The atoms are packed together in fixed positions. Okay, they have these re repeating patterns. They're all different for different solids, but they're stuck in one place. They're not going anywhere. Not that they're not moving, we'll talk about that later, but they are in a fixed position. Okay. Liquids have definite volume, indefinite shape, meaning they take the shape of their container. It's probably the way you've heard it explained for a long time. The atoms are still pretty close together, but they can slide past one another. Okay, and we'll talk about this a little bit later. Um, they stay close, but they're loose enough to actually slide past one another. And so liquid part water, you see they're close, but it's not orderly like we saw um, with the gas, I'm sorry, with the ice on this slide right here. Repeating pattern not repeating pattern. Okay, then we get gases. Gases have indefinite volume, indefinite shape, meaning that they will take the shape of their container, the atoms move very, 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 very quickly, and they are very, 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 very far apart. And again, if we keep coming back to steam, it, they're higher, uh, sorry, they're higher temperature, so they move faster, and that's the easiest way. Okay, here is a nice chart that I like that just kind of summarizes all the changes of state. Um, you've got your solid, you've got your liquid, You've got your gas, and it just gives the terms for going between all of these states. For example, for solid, going from a solid to a liquid, you have melting. Going from a liquid to a solid, you have a term called solidification. A lot of us may also just call that freezing. So feel free to also just call this freezing. You don't necessarily do solidification. It's a little tough to read. Um, and then over here you have going between a gas and a liquid. Um, going from a gases to a liquid is going to be condensation. Then you also have going from a liquid to a gas is going to be evaporation. We'll talk about a couple of other terms in class also termed vaporization as well as boiling. And we'll talk about the difference between those. And it mostly comes down to bubbles and no bubbles. Then you have two terms for going from a solid to a gas. Um, a solid directly to a gas without going through the liquid stage is called sublimation. An example of this would be dry ice. And on the opposite side, going from a gas to a solid would be deposition. And frost is a good example of this one as well. Okay, now chemical changes in matter. This is when something is actually chemically converted into a different substance, very similar to a chemical reaction. Uh, the reactants are what reacts and the products are what is formed. And we typically write this with an arrow, where over here you have the reactants, which are mercury and iodine. And then over here you have the products, which is going to be your mercuric iodide. And again, we always use that arrow to show that. There are four indications of a chemical reaction, and we'll study these more throughout the year. First is energy is released in the form of heat or light. We like this. This is when things explode. Um, this is then the production of gas bubbles from two substances, where you get gas bubbles. is not necessarily boiling, obviously. Formation of what's called a precipitate or a solid. 
and then a color change. And we're going to do a lab pretty soon that will allow us to interact with these, which allows it to make more sense. But um, at that point, this concludes our first video. And any questions, ask in class, and we will go from there.